Hello, everybody. I am Roman, the director for commercial HVAC over here at Kalo Services. Um, and you know the gentleman here to my right. We are going to be talking about indoor air quality and coil corrosion. You may also know my other special guest here, uh, Brian Orr. Go ahead and introduce yourselves, guys. Say hello to the audience. Hi. My mic is fine. You have to activate my mic. Oh, sorry. Which one is? Oh, here we go. There we go. Oh, hey, look in there. Oh, hey. yeah. That's what happens when you walk in just cold. <laughs> you know, you just walk into the room and uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm we invited Brian the like HVAC school podcast. Generally speaking, we Not invited today. Brian a minute before this started. Yeah, <laughs> I just um, walked in. <laughs> like you seem knowledgeable. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's a there's a topic that isn't really, uh, in my opinion, discussed a whole lot among open circles. Uh, definitely not from a manufacturer standpoint, definitely not from, um, you know, an indoor air quality standpoint. And from my aspect uh, on understanding with experience in the field, uh, coil corrosion is a very large, broad category that is just not really easily digestible by a lot yeah. of people there's nothing real a lot of information out there that that you know people can just readily find and understand exactly what we're talking about and why it matters and how and, much and, it really affects indoor air quality so yeah and by the way i knew nothing about coil corrosion by the way this is kevin hart the canadian not the comedian, <laughs> not the comedian. <laughs> um i knew nothing about coil corrosion and roman started talking to me about it and shaping how this could be relevant to indoor air quality yeah. So, you know, um, my career in the HVC world um, has been bumpy at times, but uh, a lot of it has stemmed from finding things in the real world, right, such as coil failures and wanting to know more about it. Right. That's how I actually found, you know, Brian and his podcast, uh, just wanting to know more about just generalized subjects. And so coil corrosion is one of those things that I kind of uh, took a deep dive in early in my career and had a lot of exposure and experience to uh, within homes. And so we typically talk about coil corrosion. There are actually uh, two different types of coil corrosion. There's, there's pitting corrosion, and then there's another type that not a lot of people like to talk about, which is formicary corrosion. Um, you know, pitting corrosion actually happens because of you know little cavities and pits that happen within the surface due to a chemical reaction with you know chlorides and fluorides and chemicals within a a home or a space in a commercial space. And then the other formicary corrosion has more of a chemical reaction that involves uh, acids on a coil. Um, and when I say coil, I am also talking about copper and aluminum in general, um, but either or in this kind of aspect with, with both of these types of corrosion. They're so both, yeah, I, go ahead. I looked up these acids. So formic acid is a colorless irritant of volatile acid. And actually ants and insects can emit this. It's sort of the burning sensation in, I think, stinging nettles in different plants. And um, so this acid is one of the primary reasons uh, in, in terms of this formicary corrosion. It's also acetic acid, which a lot of vinegars, a lot of cleaning agents have this sort of vinegary acetic acid. Um, What's interesting is that there's this analogy to ants and formic acid, but there's also the appearance of an ant nest could also be what the uh, pitting corrosion looks like. Have you seen this corrosion? What what does it look like? Yeah. So when we when we talk about corrosion, um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when people think corrosion, it's, it's rust, right? Rust is like literally the most common type of corrosion we see. We see it on everything. Uh, we see it in our homes. We see it on our vehicles uh, outside. Um, so when you think of corrosion, it kind of has that aspect to it. When we when we talk about pitting corrosion or formicary corrosion, when it involves uh, an acid um, of that kind, or like we said, chloride, what you find is it builds up like a powdery white substance on a coil itself. You'll see where it kind of looks like an ant mound in general. Everyone knows what an ant mound looks like. You go outside, especially here in Florida, fire ants. Um, it looks like this small powdery mound within a coil, on a coil, at a bend. Um, and that's kind of where, you know, especially formicary corrosion gets that nickname of ants nest corrosion. The, the, the correlation is because of the appearance that you actually find on that coil. Well, it's that, but it's also that there's, um, if, if you look at it in, under an electron microscope or even a regular microscope, yeah. in some cases, you'll see those little paths. They kind of work their way through it. And some people will call it, I had a, uh, a service manager who used to call it champagne leaks. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what he meant by that, bubbles. well, it was, yeah, it's that, but it's, it's because like, yeah, when you make bubble, when you actually use a, a bubble solution, soapy bubbles on it, or mm. as refrigeration technologies will correct you, mm. it's actually a leak reactant. <laughs> 
very important, not just soapy bubbles, um, <laughs> specifically designed for that purpose, you will see like this, like a foam that builds up. But a lot of times that happens because there's not just one exit point. Like it's, it's not just one single point where it comes out. It's yeah. actually a, uh, a range of little paths and pits that make it its way into, into the, into the copper. One thing I wanted to mention quickly, cause you were talking about rust. Mm -hmm. um, rust is a form of galvanic corrosion. So yeah. you mentioned two types, but galvanic corrosion um, is actually uh, due to an actual electrical reaction where you yeah. actually have a transfer of electrons. Um, and usually that happens between dissimilar metals. And so early on um, years ago, when I used to work at another very large company, we had this absolute um, major issue, like a, almost a, almost every coil that we had over seven years old for a certain brand would fail. Um, a lot of times guys would look at a coil and they would see that rust mm -hmm. that occurs between the steel plating and the copper and the aluminum. And they would say, well, there's my leak, right? Mm -hmm. But actually those two things are surprisingly unrelated. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just like uh, that sort of anode cathode type of relationship yep. uh, on a ship. You'll have, you'll have cathodes or you'll have um, sacrificial metals that will give the less noble metals will give themselves up. And that's a totally different type of corrosion than what we generally see causes leaks in a coil. So yep. just to kind of differentiate, um, can galvanic corrosion cause leaks? Yes. But usually when you look at a coil and it looks all rusty, yep. that's because the, the steel is actually less noble and it's actually giving itself yeah. up due to it's, galvanic yeah. corrosion. The, so, the sacrificial anode as they call right, it. Right. Correct, yeah. Correct, yeah. And, and by the way, we're talking about cooling coils, but we're also if, so this might be a dumb question, but now with heat pumps, are we also talking about the type of corrosion that could happen in a heat pump as well? Yeah. In the coil? No, I mean, so the only difference between a heat pump and a, and a what we call a straight cool system is just the fact that we're, you know, switching where our heat exchangers are, right? We're, we're sending hot gas inside. Our outdoor unit is now an evaporator. So, you know, you would be then convincing moisture outside. And so those chemical reactions, the, those solvents, they're still present outside just as much as you would find them inside. And so it would all depend upon the application of where the unit is installed as to, you know, what it's being exposed to. Uh, and in those and it seemed like the metal that it's made of when these issues happen is mostly aluminum well it depends so you actually yeah so this is actually a really interesting uh interesting question you will find that you get certain types of corrosion more on copper than you get on aluminum in fact with formic corrosion um they've actually replaced a lot of uh coils that were copper aluminum with all aluminum coils which both reduces galvanic corrosion because now yeah. you have a single metal but it also um, can reduce formic corrosion because you don't get, again, aluminum does react with certain types of chemicals, but what they found through studies is that the, the most common formic corrosion doesn't react with aluminum as much. Now that doesn't, that's not an absolute rule though, like, yeah, because, yeah, yeah. because you do, you have certain types of chemicals. Um, for example, um, even coil cleaners that are used, uh, more alkaline chemicals actually can react more harshly with aluminum than they do with copper. So it's really, it really just depends. But for, uh, the majority of manufacturers went. They kind of they kind of followed this um, this recipe. First, they went to uh, they they uh, there was a lot of aluminum coils out there, um, even a lot of copper coils. So just copper copper coils, and that was actually a solution that we used in certain like coastal environments where we were yeah. trying to reduce galvanic corrosion. Um, and then they went to all aluminum, and then they went to aluminum copper. Yep. Uh, and they were having all kinds of issues. And that was this like major challenge that we were having across. It seemed like every manufacturer had a period. <laughs> it's like, it's like train was first and then yeah. Lennox and the carrier had it. Everybody like had their season where they had all these issues. Yep. Um, and then they all said, okay, we're going to go to coatings. And those initial coatings were phenolic coatings, different types of, um, uh, different types of spray on uh, coatings. And some of them were dipped. Some of them were uh, spray applied and there were different levels of quality. Uh, and then they went back to all aluminum again. Uh, well, actually tin plating too. So tin plating, there was a yeah. tin plating phase and then they went back to, to all aluminum. But again, like um, it's, it's interesting because it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. When you go to all one type of metal, it definitely reduces galvanic corrosion, which yeah. is rarely the problem. Um, in terms of evaporative coil leakage, at least it's a, it's a problem with other things for yeah. sure. Um, like when you, when the whole thing deteriorates and falls <laughs> apart on you and just becomes a big pile of metal. Yeah. We see that all the time um, in Florida. Yeah. Right. And coastal. And that's actually a good example. Like coastal coatings. This is something that people will get confused about. Coastal coatings often are there to, or, or, 
are mostly there to reduce the galvanic yeah um so that your fins don't all fall off your coil if you've ever been out time. to yeah. yeah to coastal environments you'll look outside and it'll be like there's no fins on a condenser well that's a serious just problem or two right spun and, around it. <laughs> and that's galvanic because it's the the salt is actually helping to increase the electrolysis yeah. so you actually get more electrons moving and means it falls apart more quickly yeah um so understanding the type of corrosion is really important um, to answer your specific question, sorry, I'm just going off here. I, I came <laughs> in totally unprepared. <laughs> to answer your specific question, uh, though, about heat pumps, this is a really interesting thing because you do see a higher rate of failure in heat pumps. But the, the theory that most of us have, and again, it's only a theory, a lot of this yep. stuff surprisingly has not been proved very well in the real world, is that um, you actually get more corrosion in the cooling season when you have water present. Yeah. Um, because that water actually gathers up acids and gathers up things more yeah. readily when you're in, in winter seasons, <clears throat> when it's, when you're trying to produce heat, you have a dry coil. So it's less likely you're going to build up things, but in heating season, you have significantly higher pressures, and higher, um, temperatures, yeah. uh, higher pressures and higher temperatures, even higher than you have on the high side during cooling season in most cases. Yeah. And this is also because of the way that we tend to run heat pumps, which is my, one of my current kind of missions is so, like hey stop. a lot of eye rolls there. well oh, no, sorry I, what, I, the eye roll was not the eye roll wasn't sorry the eye roll wasn't uh rolling my eyes about that people are stupid it was like uh, me just like thinking through this yeah um that a lot of people are running lower air flows on heat pumps yeah in heat mode um yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're trying to get warmer air coming out of it yeah but the result of that is higher head pressure yep and that high, that head pressure now is present inside the evaporator coil. Yeah. Where, or sorry, artists formerly known as the evaporator coil, now the condenser inside <laughs> the indoor coil, right? And so, and so, if you have corrosion, so imagine you're in cooling mode, the thing's kind of corroding, you're getting these ant nests, and then you put it under really high pressure. Yeah. You may not be advancing the corrosion, mm -hmm. but you're definitely now testing whatever corrosion has occurred. And I, and I think that's a lot of what's happening because so there's a weak spot. Right. And now you're pressure. and now you're applying potentially 400 plus psi on an well, R410 r for any system when you weren't before yeah when on top of that too when you add when you add heat to it right when we take something from hot right. to cold to hot to cold to hot to cold you've right. got that expanding and contrasting and so if you've got like the ants nest which you were talking about where you've got those little lines that, that work their way through the coil you've got a bunch of weak spots and then you start to add you know you compress it and then you expand it you compress it and you expand it and then yeah. you start to create micro cracks and um, you know they've even shown with, with, with most coil corrosion that happens inside it actually acts as a wedge and so as it corrodes it, it, the way it pushes itself apart opens up new fresh copper and then it starts to starts all over again in that same exact process and so yeah creating those wedges and then then you know heat to cold heat to cold you might find that yeah you, you just put it under a lot more stress than it normally would be if it was just straight cool so one one other question how common or how rare is this because it's not something i had heard about but the more we've just talked about this with people around the show the more people have stories about <laughs> you know entire communities of 2500 homes where yeah it's a it's one of those things right so it's it's definitely a very touchy subject subject uh, in in regards to our industry just because manufacturers will not talk about it because it's too much of a liability because uh, there have been significant suits of like course. this is not this is not a hypothetical and like yeah. most things as soon as people see that there's money you know it's like they're, they're they see red and and then you know, and then everybody gets a black eye and so it, and then it becomes tough to even solve the problem because because everybody just starts finger pointing, which has been really frustrating. Well, you or they don't want to talk about it at all, right? It's sweep it under the rug. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Yeah. Um, when really, you know, we should be thinking about these things when we design homes, when we do installations, when we're doing, you know, heat load calculations and stuff like that, because all of those things go into that giant equation of, you know, how is this equipment actually being applied to your home, to your environment. And then this also applies to commercial applications where you see more intense chemicals, where you see it in a higher concentration, where you where you see that, you know, that, that dilution is no longer there. Um, especially when we're introducing it with other systems that have nothing to do with that one, where it's not just a, a fresh air duct that's coming into the unit and, and it's just passive. It's just bringing air in all the time, right? When you're actually relying on another system to actually bring fresh air in for those systems, and that may not be maintained properly or be set up correctly. And then you've got a, just a compounding effect across an entire building um, you know, or a wing section of a building where you have these, these premature co coil failures after a year to two years or even five years. Um, you know, everyone's heard the horror stories in the HVAC industry where you have a house or a customer or even a client on a commercial building where they've been through one to two to three to four coils um, in a specific area. And, and, you know, everybody likes to blame the manufacturer, but really this just comes down to chemistry and science, right? Yeah. It's a mixture and a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Um, and so it's kind of peeling back that onion and the layers in a specific application. We don't just sit here and say that, no, every coil failure out there is, you know, uh, formicary corrosion or, or pitting corrosion or even galvanic corrosion, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's 
how does it apply and, and what does your actual failure look like? Does it look like any of these things? Have you done any homework research? Have you done any indoor air quality measurements? Right. right. That's what we have, you know, Kevin Hart here. Right. Are, do you even know anything about indoor air quality? Right. right. Are well, you measuring any of it? Th this was something you brought to my attention, which is, well, first of all, a lot of the homes that have this problem are spray foams. And so that seems to be part of the equation here. So maybe you'd <laughs> like, why would that be part of the equation? So with spray foams, and now I'm no expert in, you know, building materials. Um, I'm, I'm not a, a chemist by nature, uh, you know, just an HVAC nerd and enthusiast, much like Brian here. Um, but, you know, with spray foam homes, uh, we find that that certain spray foams and manufacturers at our, at our early age, when we started adopting this, this type of application and technology, um, there was a lot of unforeseen consequences with the off gassing that took place with when those chemicals actually cured. So when people think of concrete, right, concrete is a chemical reaction. You take a powder, you mix it with water, and the chemical reaction actually creates heat, right? If everyone's gotten concrete, wet concrete on their hands or their feet, and you let it to sit there for a while, you'll actually find that it actually burn your skin uh, because it's, it's, it's actually a chemical reaction. And so the same type of chemical reaction, not exactly the same, but, but similar takes place when you actually spray foam on the wall. It comes out as a liquid, it expands to a foam, and then it hardens in that foam mixture. And so that process is off gassing, right? It, it's, there's byproduct chemicals that are, that are being created and emitted from it in that process of going from a liquid to a solid and curing. And unfortunately, in a lot of these homes, when they, they're doing spray foam, they have the idea, let's make it tight. Right. But there's no second, there's no thought about indoor air quality or bringing fresh air in or the consequences of having those large concentrations of off gassing within the building. And what do we do with it? Right. Are we right. measuring it? Are we doing anything with it? Um, and so you get those high concentrations of TVOCs or off gassing chemicals that then are just being circulated over and over and over again across an evaporator coil. And, and you know, the rest is history. Right. We've all seen yeah. it. Um, yeah. So. I would add, um, and kind of as for, for a and not to try to give an early conclusion here, but one big takeaway is that when you're having these situations that it's recurring, like because you will you will get one off situations. I mean, I've had cases with ductless heads where I you know pulled the fins off the coil to find where the leak is. And it's a it's a pit. But it even even then it's like looks like a manufacturing issue, like yeah. like it looks like scoring. On the tubing, <laughs> right. And, and you can tell like you can tell when it was a machining challenge at times. Yeah. And it's interesting because as I've toured mo more factories and you actually see how copper tubing is expanded into aluminum fins. Mm -hmm. It's pretty interesting. Like, like if there's any sort of contaminant present when they shoot those pigs through that actually expands that tubing, yeah. um, it can very easily create a weak spot in that copper. And I've been places where it's like, there's not a lot of quality control here. Like <laughs> there's just a dude just shooting these suckers through. And this is like a dusty environment. Like yeah. this is by no means a clean room. So yeah. I, I don't give, um, because one of the, one of the comments was it's hard to blame the homeowner when the previous coil lasted 25 to 30 years. Yeah. I, I, I don't give the manufacturers a complete pass on this, but one thing that we definitely need to be doing in the field is doing some IAQ testing, looking at, um, TVOC. And one thing that even got brought up to me recently, and I have no idea how valid this is, but, but Corbett Lunsford brought it up and it was very interesting was, um, when you have CO2 present, mm -hmm. um, he, he made the statement that, uh, it can lead to carbonic acid on the evaporative coil, which again, first time I'd ever heard it. So I, I, I'm not saying that that's necessarily true or not true, but it is definitely something to look at because even, even if you're just looking at CO2, CO2 is a leading indicator of ventilation problems. And so if you have poor ventilation, mm -hmm. you have stagnant indoor air that's not getting mixed with outdoor air. That also is a leading indicator of, of uh, VOC buildup as well. I mean, you can obviously use a TVOC sensor, but sometimes there's weird chemicals that we're not really sure if we're testing for or not. I mean, the, you know, the, the home chem study showed a lot of that where it's like, man, it's, it's really hard to know everything about a house. We can yeah. look at some indicators, but CO2 is one of those indicators yeah. um, that we, you know, again, when you, if you have a, if you have a recurring problem, it would be very wise of you to look at CO2, TVOC, and even PM 2.5 um, to just yeah. kind of see where you're at. Well, and some of the VOCs have a lower sensor response. And so if we knew the exact chemical of interest, we could build a sensor that specifically looked at that. Right, just for that, yeah. But you're gonna have this conflation of all these VOCs and you might have a lot of unrelated VOCs that are high. And so it's not gonna help you isolate the one that's actually of interest for coil corrosion. Um, but if you're measuring CO2 and you're keeping control of your ventilation mm -hmm. and then you're lowering your VOCs, that's probably going to be a step in the right direction of avoiding this coil corrosion happening. And one of the other things that was interesting is that chlorine gas, so if you have bleach and you're using cleaning agents in the home, um, there is an ability when water vapor interacts with chlorine gas that a 
creates these chloride ions and those chloride ions um, have an impact on coil corrosion um, once they're airborne and land on the coil. Yeah. And so maybe maybe if we can speak to also humidity, could that be a factor um, because it introduces that water vapor to create these reactions? Yeah, no. And so when we think about corrosion, it, there's three things that have to be present, right? You've got to have oxygen, got to have humidity, moisture, right? And then you have to have your acid. And that could be uh, chloride, that could be, you know, any type of acid, really, like you were talking about with even with CO2, right, mm -hmm. the way that it creates that. Um, so when you have those three things present, it's kind of the perfect storm. And so also depends upon how much of a concentration you have of each three of those things, right? Oxygen, it's going to be, well, you know, it depends on the home too, right? Because you yeah. can have high CO2 uh, and low oxygen content um, within the air inside the home. Um, but, you know, if you have a high concentration of, of, of acids and a high concentration, high humidity within the home, um, you're going to find that that, that that corrosion actually takes place in a lot of different parts of that coil, uh, not just at one specific band or one specific area. You'll find coils where they're just completely deteriorated in a bunch of different areas. And that was just happened to be the, the very first part that actually failed um, in that system. And so that could also, you know, tie back into, I could tie into a bunch of things, really. We could sit here and say it's because, you know, systems are oversized or no one's doing heat load calculations correctly, right? And and, and, and systems are short cycling because they're, they're oversized. You have high humidity or, um, you know, we could go off on a tangent about all these different things. But, um, but those three things, yeah, high humidity is a big factor in, um, you know, the, the process of corrosion itself and, and how severe it could be within a home in general. Yeah, I would add that um, it, there's a, there's a wide range of things that can lead to this problem. So for example, when we talk about some of these like l epidemics that we faced in the past with certain manufacturers, like th th that, that's not a, <laughs> like when you have one manufacturer that all of a sudden, like after seven years, every coil is failing, leaking, like, <laughs> like, uh, okay. Like, I mean, come on, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna blame the consumer for that. Um, but I will say that, um, it's only one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And as we use different technologies to try to solve the issue, we always end up finding other things. I mean, like a really good example of this, it's not corrosion, but when we go to all aluminum coils, now we find, um, that you get bacterial zuglia, you know, this, this, uh, gummy substance that builds up in drain pans. And, and all of this is like, it's a, it's chemistry, it's biology too, yeah. but it's chemistry. And so I would be lying if I pretended like I was a chemist and understood all of the sources of uh, of these problems. But we do know a few things we can look at. And one of the things is what is the coil made of? You know, like yep. and then and then how is it manufactured? Are you know, because we do know that we've thinned out the walls of coils. Um, we do know that that is part of the thing. You may have had older coils that had formic corrosion, but you just didn't know it because it was thicker tubing. And so yeah. that reduced it. Never reached um, the everybody's trying to make the coils lighter because they're making them bigger. And it's for good reasons. You know, you want bigger coils, you want to be lighter, guys can handle them. He transfers a little better through the walls, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, there's manufacturing processes, which is like I talked about when you're expanding that tubing. Um, I think manufacturers need to look very carefully at that now. And, and they have. And when, a lot of times what they do find is it is actually formic. So it is that ant nest that they see. And so when they see that, it's like, all right, well, there's a chemical that's attacking generally from the outside, although sometimes it can also be the inside, inside too, which yeah. is another thing. So so making sure that we're pulling good vacuums, making yeah. sure that we're having really good practices so we're not getting contaminants in there in the first place. Um, and then you have, all right, in some cases, you are going to need specialty coatings. If you're in a coastal environment and galvanic is likely to be a significant problem, then you need to look at that. Um, and then finally, indoor air quality. Like, um, and indoor air quality is all of the things we always talk about, right? So ventilation, uh, filtration, and humidity control. Those are the, that's the, you know, the holy trinity of, uh, of uh, indoor air quality. Did I miss something else there? No, no, no. I, that's I it. it. Okay. Um, I, I think it seems like if you have all these new homes where there's a lot of new materials in these new homes. There you go. Yeah. And then also on top of that, it's a spray foamed home and they don't have a source of ventilation. So right. it's a tight home, but it's not ventilated, right? Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there's no dehumidifier. So now you got a home with a lot of humidity, with a lot of off gassing, yep. with TVCs. nowhere for that humidity or TVOCs to, to go or CO2. Yeah. To Corbett's point, um, that seems like a home that, you know, potentially is a victim of this yeah. coil corrosion. And I would also add that like w the best and and uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'm going to say it like it's true. And then you guys can dis dis dispute it if you want. Um, but I, I feel strongly that it is true that the best broad range TVOC sensor on earth is the human nose, mm -hmm. especially the well calibrated human nose. So in that case, in my house, that would be like my wife's nose. Like, mm -hmm. you know, she can just notice things. And when you walk into a house, I, when I walked into my brother's house after he built it, I'm going to pick on Nathan. He used open cell spray foam everywhere. 
And when you walked in, it was like, whoa, wow. this smells like chemicals, <laughs> you know, like, and, and when you walk into a place and it smells like chemicals, that's a pretty good indication that there's probably chemicals, chemicals present, right? Huh? And that's very likely that you're going to get weird corrosion and all kinds of yeah. weird things where I use closed cell foam and a day after it was done, you really couldn't smell anything, anything. Um, which to me is an indicator that probably it was applied or mixed um, more safely. Um, and so, cause they'll tell you that all the time. The foam industry will always say like, Hey, it's all how you do it. I don't have the, the research to back that, but what I've seen consistently is open cell foam smells like a, a chemical factory afterwards nope. and closed cell foam doesn't seem to, yeah. um, why? I don't know. I'm not an expert on the chemistry, but, um, I think because they, they do cure, they don't get that kind of hard shell on them. So they're like always sort of Soft, curing yeah. and softening the inside out. I don't know. But anyway, that not, none of that is all that is circumstantial, but just to say that like source control is huge. And so when you're choosing paints, when you're choosing materials in your house, when you're storing chemicals, um, thinking through like, do I, do I need to bring these VOCs in, in the first place? Yeah. You know, when carpet smells like carpet, Mm -hmm. That means you have VOCs. Yeah. Um, and that's what always cracks me up. I, I talked to a guy the other day at AHR and he was selling some product. And he's like, you smell that? It has a fresh linen scent. <laughs> and I said, okay, so that's VOCs. You know, aren't you concerned about it? He's like, no, it's, it's, no, it's zero VOCs. I'm like, sir, <laughs> <laughs> maybe you are misinformed <laughs> but a volatile organic compound is yes, the yes. very nature of odor like so yeah. if you're smelling something it's, it's, uh, that it's, was put there it's an odor it's an you're, it's, 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 a, it's a voc odor. right it's too because even the most pleasant smell like the pine smell yeah. right you know from pine trees or christmas trees the peppermint lemon i mean you just you well, know lemon's it. a bad one lemons Lem a, lemons are very naughty i mean you talked about that right Re uh, yeah well lemon lemonine. interacts lemonine reacts um and creates from all the when it interacts with ozone yeah you know and there's natural levels of ozone but also people like to put ozone generation products and in, into their systems for in, indoor air quality and so that just creates right cleaning cleaning that <laughs> has unintended you yeah. know third right. derivative Consequences. type yeah. chemical reactions yeah and what what cracks me up is and this is true of so many things it's it's true with uh, carbon monoxide it's true with carbon dioxide it's true with all this stuff it's like Anybody remember Chinese drywall, the whole yes, Chinese yes, drywall thing? Yes, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So everybody's like, oh my gosh, it's terrible. You know, like everything's falling apart and it's a major problem. Well, the reason it was such a major problem is because it was so bad and it happened so fast. Okay. Yeah. So you're telling me that there's nothing that's like Chinese drywall that's going on right now, but it just takes so much longer yeah. and it's so much slower yeah. or it's a compounding with different things. I mean, it, that's a ridiculous idea. Like there is stuff that we're bringing into our houses and it's not just, it's not just a China problem. It's a, it's a, what are the materials? What's the manufacturing yeah. process? What's the environment that it's being manufactured in? If you walk into some, I've, I've walked into some um, factories where it's like, it smells like toxic in there. It's like, yeah, and you're making all this stuff in here and it's absorbing all those chemicals. And when you bring it to the house, it yeah. is now adsorbing or, or sorry, desorbing all of that, um, all of that, those chemicals. And yeah. so it'll just disappear, right? So the, it's just like when it's not just like, sorry, this is a, maybe not a great metaphor, um, <laughs> but or simile um, when techs say like, I've been doing this 30 years. and I've never had a problem. It's like by that, you mean that you put that compressor in and it doesn't explode in your face while you're there, <laughs> right? That's what you mean. But that compressor fails in five years when it could have lasted 20. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same thing with chemicals. It's like, we're like, oh, it's fine. The levels are fine. Well, okay, but compared to what? Yeah. You know, like how long is it going to last? And also when you're compounding, so like, all right, well, you bring in, okay, well, the carpet by itself is that's not too many VOCs, but and then the drywall. Slow VOCs. And then the paint. And then the and then the uh and then the cabinets and then the appliances. And then and you stack that all up. Furniture. Yeah. And now, oh yeah. I mean, you talk about new furniture. Yeah, fabrics and foams. foams I mean, foams yes. are uh, I listened to this terrifying presentation. This is an aside, but this terrifying <laughs> presentation by this uh, by this professor and really brilliant guy, doctorate on the topic. And he's like, have you ever thought like you buy a new pillow uh, and it comes from who, you know, God knows where. Yep. And you literally bury your face in that sucker all night long. Yeah. He's like, you want to talk about you want to talk about like causes of asthma and, um, and different allergies and all that. It's yeah. like. And you are overloading your system potentially yeah. with, I mean, you smelled a new pillow sometimes, like, especially the, like the foam, the really foamy yeah. ones. They just oh, that's smell. definitely true. And I, so I have a buckwheat pillow, so it's filled with buckwheat. Husks. <laughs> I had one. Yeah. I had <laughs> and, one. and it's covered in a silk, uh, uh, sheet on the outside. Um, but if you have, so you're breathing, so there's moisture or you're drooling in your pillow, whatever. And then you got <laughs> dust mites right. that are coming and eating the skin flakes off of your face. <laughs> <laughs> and then they poop on the pillow. Nobody's going to sleep ever yeah. again after then, they, <laughs> then they poop on the pillow. Uh -huh. Right. And then they eat all the feathers and stuff inside of most pillows, what they're made out of. 
I mean, those things are nasty. And you're spending eight hours a night breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, Just sticking that. your face in it. Yeah. 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 Can't get enough. So that's gross. <laughs> so yummy, 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 yummy. Yum, nom, 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 nom. Yeah. No one's going to sleep on pillows anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> one, one, of my kid, one of my kids told me the other night, he's like, you know, you eat one bug every night on average. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm pretty sure that's not true. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by bug. I mean, oh, if man. it's like, you mean like microscopic, then yeah. Statistics. Yeah, it's I millions. Mean, there's of something like that for spiders or something like that. Like, like, yeah. like four spiders a year crawl yeah. into your mouth or something like that. Yeah. You're yeah. Don't say that to Danielle, my assistant. She will just stop sleeping forever. She hates spiders so much. Yeah, but well, you know, I, I have a quick question. So a yeah. lot of this we're talking about residential, but I heard that this is maybe even more common in commercial. So I'm wondering, is that because of commercial coils are built differently or is it because like we were in a brewery last night? Is it that you've got more of an abundance of, let's say, acetic acid in the air that because of the concentration of chemicals, maybe in an industrial commercial site, is that uh, creating the coil corrosion more frequently? What is what is the difference between residential and commercial? Um, so residential commercial, sometimes it comes down to, to price point, right? Every piece of equipment, even in residential market, uh, they're all made manufactured to a specific price point. And so it all depends on what they're designing the project for or what they're willing to spend on the type of product that they have. You know, a lot of things come into play too, where, you know, if a space is just a uh, structural build out, right? And it's just a couple package units on the roof, but then they turn that, that structural build out into a brewery. Um, or, or, or a place where they're going to actually start manufacturing, you know, kombucha. Like, you know, those things matter. Uh, that mm -hmm. was never taken into account with the actual design of the building. And so, yes, of course, that's going to have a huge negative impact on what you have there. You know, they would have done it differently. They would have actually got a dedicated system that's designed to be in environments like that just for that space and then ventilated it properly to where they're actually getting more air exchanges than you naturally need yeah. just to account for the buildup of those chemicals. Yeah. Um, and, and it happens all the time, especially in the commercial industry, because the, there's a lot of companies out there who are buying land and dirt cheap or, or, or at a reasonable price and just building shells like crazy and then selling each tenant space to individual clients, not right. taking into account or aspect or even informing the customer if they even know about it, that, that the way they're going to be using the space goes against what the initial, initial design was for that piece of equipment. And that happens all the time with commercial equipment. That's why commercial equipment carries such a small warranty, right? It's that one year commercial warranty because you know you use and abuse it and, and don't use it properly. Yeah. It, it's going to fail. Well, even, even simple things like not changing the filters, like uh, you know, the filters <laughs> like you think it's bad in houses i mean commercial it's terrible oh it's awful um but we've seen cases where like you'll go into certain nail salons or um or uh, places that do hair you know maybe they're doing brazilian blowouts in there or something that's really <laughs> no i'm serious like because it's formaldehyde no it's it used is in yeah. a lot of those yeah, cases yeah. Right. and um and you'll go in and it's just like holy moly and um and you know codes have started to catch on but you still have a lot of legacy um properties um where like you said people just move in and they don't have proper makeup air. They don't have proper because it's a totally different animal, right? You can't just you can't just go in and put, oh, hey, this used to be a, you know, a, a thrift store, and now I'm going to make it a nail salon. That doesn't work, or a restaurant, or um, yeah, there's just there's lots of different things that we've seen. A print a print shop. And there's print shops that you know a lot of chemicals going on in those processes, and it all has to be accounted for, especially in the ventilation and dehumidification side. Well, and so a huge point to that too is um, with the, with something that's a, a big thing right now in our market um, is we're turning a lot of uh, greenhouses, we're turning a lot of storage facilities into grow houses, right, for for, for, for marijuana. Um, and there's a lot of chemicals that go along with that process too. And so we're actually, as an industry, just figuring out how we're supposed to be doing this. Is it chilled water? Is, is it DRF? Is it, is it you know, specific DOAS systems with charcoal filter and coconut shells, right? That we're throwing everything at it just to try to yeah. get some kind of solution to where we can do what we want to do in the building space, but also control the environment that it's not going to have some kind of negative effect towards, um, you know, the equipment that we have that's supposed to be conditioning these spaces in the first place. So yeah. there's uh, nothing worse than a, than an air conditioner that has the munchies. You don't <laughs> give it a sandwich. It gets really cranky. It's a, it's a, it's a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, for sure. No. And, and kind of, so to your point, um, do we see more of it in commercial than residential? I don't necessarily see more of it, but you yeah. get, you get these repeat patterns. And so like we see it, uh, we have a dentist office, um, we have a ductless in, and, um, and there's a lot of chemicals in a dentist office, you know, and it just keeps recurring. And it's like, Fluoride at some is one point, of those things. it is right. It's, Fluoride's on the list. it's one of those things that we need to be looking at. And do they put different systems in dentist offices? The answer is no, no. not in the design. Um, and a lot of that even comes down to design engineers. Cause like, for example, with this particular space, it was engineered. I mean, it was, there was a design made yep. and, they weren't really thinking of the ventilation in a different way. They weren't thinking of, hey, you know, yeah. like not only is it a, is it a, is it as um, 
something to be concerned about for the occupant's health, which is clearly the most important thing, but also of course. for the longevity of the equipment. And in some cases, you may say, hey, let's go ahead and phenolic coat these. Let's let's dip these coils, you know, yeah. because then that really does uh, help prevent a lot of those issues. Yeah. That was the solution that we ended up coming up with a lot in the past. Yeah. Um, and it affects the performance a little bit. It does. But um, but sometimes that's the only only solution. Permanent solution. Yeah, because sometimes applications and for the instance that you mentioned, like the, the dentist office, right? It's in a server room. So you're not going to dump a bunch of fresh air into there, right? You're not going right. to just flood it with fresh air. You you can't do that. You've got electrical equipment in there and stuff like that. And so um, for, for specific scenarios where you can't just ventilate and bring in fresh air, yeah, you do have to come up with a, a creative solution. And, and nine times out of ten, that is a coating. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, it seems complicated. Like who's who's responsible? Who's holding the bag? You've got, you know, could the manufacturer have done something different? Did the person who engineered or designed what system was supposed to be in there, yeah. were they responsible? If a tenant changes out, like are you supposed to catch that? Yeah, this, you know, jewelry um, retail store changed into a nail salon. You know, is it the tenant that's responsible? Is it the indoor air quality that caused it? If so, who's responsible for that? Was it the HVAC? uh you know company was it the designer was it was it the tenant so seems seems like a complicated thing yeah, it, to it is but i think like what what um the way this stuff actually gets done in the real world is you take you start with best practices which is kind of like what we're talking about right now we made a list of things here if we were to write it down there would be this whole list of check boxes yeah and then those become standards right at some point somebody interprets that into okay here's what this looks like for a dentist office and, and a lot of that stuff does already exist i'm not yeah. but, but but some of it is a little too vague and what it also always lacks here's a plug for you kevin and i'm going to tee this up for you <laughs> is it lacks testing right testing so you may say hey here's here's how much air you need to bring in here's the air changes you need for this type of a structure but it doesn't also say yeah but you also should have a testing you know, some sort of sensor pack that proves that it's not exceeding certain acceptable levels and what those acceptable levels are and what the chemicals you're looking for are by uh, industry. Like th that's where we're headed. Um, mm -hmm. That sort of um, real life demand uh, ventilation, real life demand sensor technologies that you can actually say, hey, now now we've got a problem. And then you can troubleshoot what the source is. Is the source the fluoride uh, as part of the, the dentistry or is it the carpet or is it the ceiling tiles or what is it, you know, what's actually yeah. causing it? But until you have a standard, um, that, that again, that stems from real best practices, not just somebody just making it up. And that's the problem with some standards is it's just, you have know, people in an ivory tower, which is what I'm just about to talk about next year. Uh, <laughs> people from an ivory tower making these standards um, from a position of not really having direct experience. You yeah. have to have this like um, sequence. And I think, the, the reason why it's getting worse and worse is it's just like when you engineer, when you over engineer things. Yeah. I listened to this great podcast that talked about slide rules. Okay. I know this sounds like a crazy diversion, but, um, but like back in the day when you did not have accurate computing power, you had to over engineer everything just to be safe, just yeah. cause, cause you didn't even have, even using the slide rule, you had these like fudge factor. And so you had to over engineer Room for air. as we begin to get, like, we think we're smarter and we are in a lot of ways, like we were better at math we get closer and closer to the line. It's like, it's like optimizing. It's like putting a chip in your, in your engine of your car where you like get closer to like, just, yeah. you're just blowing the head gasket on the sucker. Like <laughs> two a, more miles per gallon. Yeah. Yeah, go. yeah. 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 <laughs> like I did on my diesel truck that I had for a while, just blew the head gasket on the sucker. Cause I chipped it and just went overboard. Yeah. Um, and like, so, so the more you do that, the, the riskier it gets and that's what everybody's done. And they've done it for the sake of efficiency is largely a big one. And that's both in the, the ceiling of the structures, and it's in the just the kind of really fine tuning the equipment for certain things. We've talked about that, like with the humidification, but it's also because of expense. And that's a big one. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, outsourcing is a big challenge that we face. And it's not because there's anything wrong with things being made in other countries necessarily, but it's when you don't have control. Like when it's being made yeah. by someone else and they're shipping it to you and saying, hey, here's what this is. And you never actually inspected that factory. You never had any standards in place. And you then just foisted on the populace. And you really don't know what's in it. Yeah. Um, and we see that time and time again. I mean, yeah. um, all you got to do is just buy something from wish.com and see, uh, you know, see what you end up getting with that. You know, like we all know this now that like yeah. um, there's a lot of stuff that's being sold because of price and it ends up having a lot of toxic chemicals in it. And I think that creates this um, this toxic 
uh, soup that results in, again, what we're talking about, which is specifically coil corrosion, but it's not just coil corrosion. It's no, a lot of it's, different things yeah. that affect, <clears throat> affect human health and, and longevity of equipment. And coil corrosion, I mean, we're talking about a small little portion of, of everything that could go wrong within a space, right? There, there's so many negative health effects that could happen, um, you know, within that space that not just coil corrosion, right? Because if it's in, if it's on the coil and it's eating metal, you know, how great is it for us right? right. Uh, in general? So yeah. It's a fascinating conversation because it the relationship between IAQ and coil corrosion had never been brought to my attention. and But oh, it's yeah. just another reason why... You're I mean, it, it's a chicken and egg problem, <laughs> right. which is that nobody's monitoring IAQ right now, like barely anybody. So how do you create a standard around something that nobody's doing? You need somebody to start and collect some data. Right, which is what I was saying. Like Until you know that IAQ monitoring should be part of solving these, uh, these corrosion problems, you're not going to do that. Once you know that that is, then you're going to start doing it and you're going to start learning things. Yeah. And like, I'm not, this is, this is fairly new to me too. I'm, I'm ta I always talk like I'm a, like this expert and like, I'm always, like no, I, I, these, these are just, these are like thought experiments. Um, yeah. and somebody you, should do a talk on humility. They should. And then, <laughs> that way you actually, that way you actually test your assertions rather than just blathering on about them on a live stream that you just happen to sit down at and, uh, and, uh, just, pull, just pulling stuff out of your rear end. Um, but yeah, that's the, the I think this is the direct, this is the path we're on. And I think products like Haven uh, and others are going to be really helpful with us saying, OK, now we can start to see this correlation. Yeah. Now let's see if we can prove causation. You yeah. know, that's that's the scientific method applied. Yeah. And uh, and I think we're getting closer and closer. The challenge with the scientific method is that everybody wants to distill it to a lab and then you lose a lot of the veracity the of the testing. Right. Yeah. And so we really have to get to a place where we're applying um, we're not applying 100% of the rigor that you can give in a lab, but we're doing a pretty darn good job where we, we, we can as close as to prove as we can that this correlation that we're seeing is causation. And we've got a couple things here, carbon, carbon dioxide. Is that actually true? We can test that. Um, spray foam. Is that actually true? We can test that. TVOCs. Uh, and we can test it sometimes in a lab, but really it's best tested in the field because in a lab, you best believe they're going to, when they apply the foam, they're going to apply it right. You know, and, and, and really, I think a lot of the challenges that we face yeah. are when things aren't right. You know, like when things aren't the way they're supposed to be, that's when you start to see these, yeah. these issues. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about the home chem study and how many, you know, millions of dollars of equipment they needed, like looking at all the chemicals and all the interactions of the chemicals in a real home. So you'd probably have to do that. Plus have an electron microscope looking at the coil I mean, you're talking about yeah many millions of dollars of equipment that has to sit there for potentially years to see this effect happen if you do it that way but i think what you do instead is um similar to what uh, april air did in their demification study that i that i was lucky to have been a part in of um years ago when you look at uh, some early demification studies that show lake mary florida i was the the nerd 20 year old tech who was there um <laughs> and and actually what's funny is is i remember a lady being there with me and i'm pretty sure at this point that it was nikki krueger wow. i just didn't know that i never put the i never put the Correlation thing together the so it's just yeah. a, it was just a funny thing anyway that was a, that was a totally weird flex the point was <laughs> The point that I'm making is that um, that that study has been really helpful, and it was a fairly small study. Um, it was something like five houses, something like that, or maybe even less. Um, but it still showed problem, yep. problem solved. Right? Sometimes that's all we really have to show is yeah. like um, we maybe don't know everything all the way down to ex the exact chemical always because we do have limitations. Science always has limitations, and then you you have a technological breakthrough, and now all of a sudden you can really prove your assumptions or you learn something new. But I think with this partic in particular, let's just look at some places that you have recurring coil problems. Let's yeah. go in with some sensors like Haven. And let's just see what we get. Yeah. See if we can solve these issues with ventilation, and then see if you know it was failing every two years, and now does it fail again in two years? You know, yeah. mm -hmm. that's not super scientific, but if you do that same sort of thing 10 times and 10 times you get a positive result, I don't know. I think that's still science. I think it's still science because, I mean, if you really dig deep into science, I mean, there's almost never 100% correlation or sorry, causation right. because you can't really know why something does what it does. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Like, you can't know why it does it. You can't talk to the creator and be like, well, and why did you make that decision? <laughs> right, did like, you make that choice? Right, <laughs> right. It, it, you, right. Can, you can really nail it down to like, we think it's this mechanism, like we can see 
we can come up with a really good story why it's mm -hmm. this mechanism, but yeah. you, you just can't a hundred percent know. I don't know. My mother-in-law does. She talks to the creator a lot and I, I think <laughs> she might be right. I mean, she's right an awful lot. So I don't know, maybe, <laughs> um, but no, like it, that's, what's funny. And my dad and I always talk about this. The more you drill down, and you just keep asking why's so you end up hitting a point where you don't have an answer to the why anymore. Yeah. Uh, and science. that's, and that's still science, right? Yeah. That's still, that's still fine. And I think the more we do that, that's what frustrates me. Like, for example, that, um, that, um, I forget what it was university of Minnesota or something like that did the study that, that proved that, um, dirty coils, dirty condenser coils don't, don't cause, um, high energy consumption. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in a lab, they replicated all these things. And when you actually broke down how the test was done, it was absolutely crazy. Like, <laughs> and it wasn't like, I, I don't think the guy's a bad guy or anything. I think he's a, a very bright scientist. I don't think he's anything, but like the conclusion was totally wrong and you can prove it with measure quick and any dirty condenser that you then wash, right? You don't need all of this test lab gear testing. to prove Correct. that, Hey, the wattage now is lower than the wattage was before. Right. I mean, the, the. Um, the COP, the ER is all yeah. better than it was before. That's not rocket science. Trash right? bag removed from the coil. <laughs> and so sometimes, sometimes it's like we overdo it um, in order to prove something where I think we can just start to see as similar to somebody um, uh, was bringing this up before, but just like different chemicals and all that similar to the, um, to the Chinese drywall situation. Like we, you didn't have to know everything that was going on to know that the houses that had this drywall were absolutely falling to shambles. Right. Yeah. And once you replaced it, it stopped. You get yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just need to, we just need to get ahead of it. So it doesn't have to be that bad because I would contend that there's probably a hundred different iterations of that with different products that just aren't as extreme. And yeah. so it never gets pointed at and said, well, that's the, that's the source of you, the issue. You could come to something like, Oh, every home with an ERV where, VOC levels are kept below 200 ppb, never experiences this problem. Right. Like we might get to that point where right. there's some formula. Yeah, but we're also always changing building materials, right? Like you said, with coils back and forth, back and forth. And so by the time maybe we narrow something down, right. it changes again. Right. And, and now it's this ever evolving nonstop. Right. Now all of a sudden you have a problem. And that's what we've seen. It's like, oh, hey, we didn't have a problem. Oh, hey, tin plating solved it. Oh, no more problems. It's like, oh, now those are leaking. No, okay. Aluminum, <laughs> all aluminum that solves back it. Oh, okay. Board. Well now that we have got bacterial zuglia and oh, by the way, they're leaking now too. And by the way, when they leak, you can never fix them because nobody knows how to fix aluminum. And oh, by the way, they're microchannel condensers now or microchannel coils. And now they're leaking just by being touched because the, you know, it's, it's, it's always something, you know, never and, uh, and Hey, that's the fun, right? Yeah. You know, we no. just get to be endless problem solvers, but definitely, um, I feel like you should, cause like you haven't said a single salesy thing this whole time. So you yeah. should like end it with something. Enter Haven like, plug super, here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> like, so everyone buy a Haven now. Buy a Haven. <laughs> that <laughs> will solve all of your problems. Well, that's so the message. We, we took 46 minutes to get to this point. Yeah. But no. <laughs> I mean, an interesting thing about Haven is we're in the return duct. So we are measuring the chemicals going through the duct. Whereas yeah. if you put a monitor in the kitchen, okay, great. You're yeah. monitoring what's happening in the kitchen, but you know, certain gases are heavier than others. What's actually getting into the duct. So I think monitoring VOCs, for example, in the return duct, that's heading towards the coil, yeah. right? Um, and so that, and then introducing ventilation and being able to automate uh, through our controller, the ability to get rid of that buildup of high VOCs. You know, we see a lot of homes where chemical levels are getting really high because there's spray foam, because it's a tight home where they have a lot of off gassing. They bring in some carpets with some awful glue and you can smell the carpet smell. So, I mean, as long as you can measure that and control it, which is exactly what Haven does, I think, you know, not only is it going to improve human health, um, but it's also going to potentially avoid coil corrosion. We don't know that for sure, but seems like a good use I mean, case. Yeah, it's, it's a step in the right direction. Well, right? It's certainly, and, and kind of to, to your point on that, like it doesn't hurt yeah. to measure that. And and it, and if you see a space where you clearly have elevated levels of TVOC, CO2, and PM2.5, yeah. well, it's worth solving those problems anyway, right, for other reasons. So solve them, uh, and then maybe you've also solved, solved a good part of your coil corrosion problem, yeah. right? So yeah. yeah. Avoided, it, avoided other issues in the, in the same process. Yeah. It does seem like whether it's, you know, mold growing in the home, the actual structure of the home, the health of the people in the home, mm -hmm. or whether it's, you know, the efficiency and performance of the system, um, coil corrosion, all of this. I mean, IAQ, it, it's typically the thing that's thought of last and typically you need a good foundation <laughs> for IAQ to sit on top of. Like if you have restrictive static pressure, air, air velocity, it, you probably can't do IAQ very well. You probably can't build in a better filter unless you, Kind of have a good foundation good static pressure to begin with so iq is kind of the last thing that people think about but it has so many benefits if people could get there 
Yeah. No, and it, it has lasting long-term, you know, benefits to it. It's not just like a, a patch, right? It's a band-aid. No, this is permanent fix. I mean, when you're always monitoring and you you propose the solutions and you make the the fix or repair or whatever it may be, if it's ventilating uh, or removing those chemicals from your space, um, you know, that has a positive long-term effect on you and uh, your health. So well, yeah. things change. Things change, right? Like you can set a standard for ventilation, but then you could be overventilating. Right. You could set a standard, but then you change the sort of ventilation, the, the chemical load in the home, and then you need more ventilation. Like we see a lot of hospitals are overventilating to the mm -hmm. tune of many millions of dollars a year. So having a live performance analysis yeah. is something that's important. Yeah. 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 And that's yeah. And yeah, to kind of to to summarize, because somebody in the in the uh, chat is asking, like, all right, so like how do you reply? Like how how do you you know, how do you land this? All right, a couple things. <laughs> Use best practices when you are like all the stuff we talk about, flow nitrogen when brazing, build a really good vacuum, make sure you're not getting crap inside the unit, whether it's dirt or water or whatever, you know, like, hey, don't open the system when it's like raining outside, you know, all that stuff. I mean, because I'm serious, that stuff, it's like, I pull a really good vacuum. Yeah, but you also are doing pipe work in the rain. Probably not the best idea. Yeah. Um, those things can all cause internal issues with corrosion. On the external side, it's all the basic stuff that we talk about all the time. Make sure that you have good filtration, make sure that you yeah. have some sort of ventilation strategy, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're going to use things like foams or other products, uh, make sure you're using professionals um, who really do have a great reputation and do a good job and try to use as many low VOC products as you possibly can. Think yeah. about that. Um, for heaven's sake, especially if you're doing like a kid's nursery, I mean, uh, for Pete's sake, like do not take, build your kid's nursery and paint it with all new paint and buy a brand new crib with, you know, foam padding and all that stuff. It just drives me crazy because I really do think there is a correlation between that movement and how many um, different conditions we're starting to see with children. Um, yeah. And drink raw milk. And drink raw milk and drink water. Oh, no, we always talk about it. I, I do this every time. I do this every time with Kevin where it's like, no, but it's like your grandma's advice, right? Like get fresh air, drink clean water, eat eat yeah. fresh food, you know, get exercise. It's all that stuff. But but we're talking about coils here. So sorry, I'll focus. Um, and and then use some monitoring. Like when in doubt, yeah. um, use some monitoring and, and also know the conditions. Like if you're in a coastal environment, if there is some sort of, if it's a commercial situation, um, look at things like DOAS, look at things um, that are gonna specifically address that. And then in a worst case scenario, consider coatings, consider um, other coil technologies. Don't just keep going in with that same coil every time because it's it's gonna be really embarrassing for you and very upsetting for your client. Um, yeah. and, and ultimately, if you see certain manufacturers that are, really spitting out rough issues. I would encourage you pull that coil apart, figure out where that leak really is. Yeah. And you will often be able to kind of figure out, is it, where is it occurring? Is it occurring at a joint? Um, is it, is it a, some sort of machining that you can see, or is it potentially just forming? Um, and we've done that many times. Yeah, no, it's good. It's really good. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I think that will, that will do us for today. So all right. I appreciate it, Brian. Thank you, Kevin, for coming on. All right. And uh, yeah. Thank Talk you for soon. doing me. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>